That brings us to item number 17, which is a recommendation regarding the 2018-19 makeup days shown in Exhibit E. Thank you, Mr. Gant. School District 5 has closed schools to students five days this school year due to inclement weather. To recap, students missed four days, Tuesday, September 11th through Friday, September 4th by order of the governor due to Hurricane Florence and another school day on Thursday, October 11th due to Hurricane Michael. During a special call meeting on October 1st, the school board approved three makeup days lost due to inclement weather. Monday, October 8th, which we've already made up. Also Friday, March 29th and Monday, April 22nd. On January 14th, the school board approved policy IC which allows local boards to waive up to three additional days by majority vote of the board after the district has made up three days or the appropriate number of missed hours. Due to the possibility of more inclement weather in the academic year and the limited makeup day opportunities in the current school year calendar, the administration recommends that the school board forgive the remaining two days students must currently make up due to inclement weather. Because this is an IC policy, Mr. Giuliano and I will both partner on answering any questions that you might have. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Goggins. <clears throat> that brings us to item number 18, which is the final schematic design presentation, elementary school 13. Mr. Doug Quackenbush, we'll turn it over to Mr. Quackenbush. Delighted to be back at Irmo High School. That's usually our conversation whenever I have a presentation is to remind everybody I'm a graduate of this That's high right. school. Terrific to be back here tonight. So We're proud you. that you're a graduate of Irmo High School. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Mr. You Hughes, much. I see you smiling big back there. He is proud as well. graduate. Much younger than me, though, unfortunately. Um, so delighted to be in front of you and give you this uh, final update of our schematic design um, that we wrapped up uh, about a week ago. Um, the slides that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight are very similar to the ones shared with the community on January the 24th, and I met with uh, each of you and went through your questions and comments in detail. So I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, but leave plenty of time, of course, for additional uh, Q&A. Uh, we'll start with the site plan. This probably has been the most vetted drawing of all the drawings that were in the schematic design set. Um, you're aware of uh, traffic improvements plan for Amex Ferry Road, great deal of upgrades there to enhance safety and ensure traffic flow, and additional internal site circulation, which includes a, uh, a, a, a traditional car loop as well as a pre-K K car loop. When you add those two linear footage uh, car loops together, you exceed the district elementary school standard by nearly double at about 3,200 linear square feet. We also have a bus loop, dedicated bus loop of about 1,600 linear square feet. Dedicated play areas directly off of each end of the school, on the east, the upper grades, on the west, the kindergarten grades, service and PE field. A lot of natural uh, vegetation will be preserved in this plan. There we go. Uh, the floor plan, three uh, primary concepts that I'll focus on. Again, I think you're aware. The first is that this plan is designed around a central secure courtyard and outdoor learning environment that not only provides that outdoor amenity in a very safe and secure way, but also provides additional daylighting into the interior of the building. Daylighting, very, very important in learning environments, as all of you know. Second characteristic is the media center being the living room of the school, that the learning environment circle around a two-story media uh, center uh, that really becomes that flex educational space. Uh, we also have extended learning uh, communities off of each of the classroom spaces for uh, uh, a variety of instructional, um, uh, additional instructional opportunities, collaboration, project team-based learning, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final uh, is the, the division of the classroom space from the public areas, the public areas to the left. Uh, those can be opened up after hours and we can lock down the classroom uh, wing of the building and keep that safe and secure, monitoring much, much easier. The second floor plan stacks over the first as an L shape for the upper grades, uh, the grades 
third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then you can see the pop-up of the two-story spaces from below there on the left. Uh, this is a, a bird's eye view from the Amex Ferry uh, um, corridor. Uh, so this is essentially the front of the school. That uh, central spine that you see there articulated with the canopy would be where the car loop and the bus loop both uh, let the students out to enter the school. We're looking at a mixture of materials that are very indigenous in the area and trying to respect the site, the use of red brick, stone, glass, and metal. This is a more uh, detailed view along that front. This is looking into the, the commons, the cafeteria, and the multi-purpose room that, act, that also acts as a stage. And then along the northwest, on the back side, this is a more organic shape that signifies the entry for pre-K and K, and their dedicated play, play space as well. This is where that dedicated drop-off for parents occurs for those younger students. I mentioned the secured courtyard that's at the heart of the school, additional daylight, additional outdoor learning opportunities, and a, and a detailed view that's looking back, if this clicker will work, there we go, uh, to the media center that is adjacent to it. Some interior views, this is a view of the lobby when you come in the front where the car loop and the bus loop let off. You come into this two-story space if you continue straight, you see the glass that fronts the internal courtyard. Off to the right, you see admin and that secure entrance. And then some views of the extended learning uh, communities, environments. Here we go, this is pre-KK. You can see the roof pops up slightly to emit some additional daylight into that area for the younger kids. This is the extended learning area right outside the classrooms for first, second, and third grade. The media center just off to the left. And then this is a view inside the media center. It's a little bit bleached out, this slide, but if you look uh, towards the, um, where you see a little bit of green, that is your view into the secure courtyard just off the media center. <clears throat> And then uh, a quick update on where we are in terms of the process. This is at a final schematic design. We're about 15% through our contract with you. Uh, we're now in the process of working with Mr. Greg Hughes in contract construction to get things priced to set our final schematic design budget that we'll hopefully track throughout the rest of the phases. Um, after uh, we finish this phase, we go into design development, which is a couple of months, another pricing exercise construction documents, which is the real heavy lifting for putting the, the, the contract documents together, uh, and then OSF review, and then we bid it, and then we are underway in construction. We have shown in the schedule the opportunity to do an early site package. At this point, we're anticipating that we will be doing that. So that'll get spade in the ground actually a little bit faster. So I'll take any questions you have about design, process, or anything else. Your questions, Ms. Hammond. <clears throat> I have, um, what is the capacity of the new school? 750 students. Um, and when we, the, our la is our latest new school? Would it have been Oak Point of our new of our? And it was 900, right? Not likely. Uh, I it's my it understanding was. that I, the typical. I may be wrong. Is 750? That's it the was, district standard. I know we yeah. set that sort of as a goal you know, for our elementary schools, but I was thinking the design was for now. In, in the programming sessions, Jan, I will share with you, I think it was a, a, a universal consensus that 750 is the largest we want to get with elementary schools. And that's certainly been our experience too as a firm, getting beyond 750. Um, it's just difficult scale-wise for the younger kids. I, I want to correct that because I'm looking at the uh, December 13th, 2010 update from uh, the construction manager at the time and uh, the opening day student capacity was 750 for that school for the new school which was prototypical on on uh, Derek's pond and the the student core capacity was 900 it was 900 at at that plan and it was prototypical from uh, Oak Point Elementary School and it was that school was supposed to be site adapted 
So we are <coughs> designing a school that's 150 students less than than what we were going to have at at, at uh, Derrick Pond. Mr. Lovis, I, I think we need to concentrate on elementary 13. You're you're talking about Derrick Pond. No, it's I, not the point built. is is that we we were. We, we did have a 900 school capacity. That's what Oak Point Elementary is, and Oak, this one is 750. Oak Point was built as a 750 school capacity. And you're looking at, at a document there, which is, which is great, but it, it's 750. We have a school policy size. Ms. Hammond, you, were you yeah. finished with your question? Well, that, I was, my point was where Chapin is where the growth it has the most growth. I was just being sure that 750, I want to see what school 13 was going to be built for, and to be sure it would handle the <clears throat> the okay. growth, because it's being I, built for seven hundred fifty. That's what I want. Ms. Hutchison, um, I I would like for um, either you, Mr. Gant, or perhaps someone in the administration to explain core capacity. That's been talked about. I know someone in public participation mentioned that, and um, it is it is misleading. Um, and that's, I think it would be helpful for us to explain that. Um, I don't know who would like to do that, Mr. Gant, Dr. Melton. But with elementary schools, it's not that complicated because, it, because you don't have, um, you, you typically design the classrooms, the number of seats in the classroom, and that gives you your count. With the upper grades where you have the flexibility to be shifting classrooms, your capacity can increase. What I suspect, Mr. Loveless is referring to is that a core, which is the other driver for capacity, the core being the size of the commons, the size of media, size of gym, uh, uh, it can sometimes be another indicator, uh, but at the elementary school, it's, it's relatively simple. It's the seats in the classrooms, and then making sure that the commons that we settle on can handle the number of periods of lunches that you want to do. So. That's just my, t I'm sorry, if yeah. you have a better answer, you probably do, that was but a good answer. that's yeah. our understanding of elementary. Well, I, Dr. Melton, I think at our last meeting, our previous meeting, you did a great job of explaining, um, you know, the, the optimal level that we have set for school size and why maybe what we are seeing where it says core capacity really is not, um, matching up with the actual use of the school and the program and et cetera. So can you um, please tell us that again? Well, you know, in education, we have our own, um, our own way of describing and defining things. So we may need a, a cheat sheet of definitions, but we talked about the program capacity. If we have a class that has special needs, imagine we have a, a group of self-contained students that may have six or eight or ten students and may have three adults in the classroom because of the needs of the students. The room may have been built for 24 or 25 elementary school students, but because of the instructional design of the programming of the school, those students are taking up the same amount of space. However, when we have the opportunity to design a space for students with special needs, there are certain things we take into consideration. Do we need changing tables? Do we need access for wheelchairs? What kinds of things might we need? Um, as Mr. Quackenbush said, the core capacity, we have to think about elementary school, and I'll use this location because of where we are. Irmo High School has lunches, but in elementary school, the entire grade level will go in and out of lunch at the same time or in and out of the play area around the same time. So the playground comes in consideration, the cafeteria comes into consideration, the gym or the multi-purpose room comes into consideration. Although we schedule for the multi-purpose room to have one or two classes, depending on the number of physical education teachers, we need to make sure there's room space for the students to get inside in case there's a school event, in case there's inclement weather, in, in case there is a PBIS celebration to make sure that it can accommodate students. And then, of course, you want to have locations that can bring the student body together so that you can have those community building experiences and where might those locations be. So there's the core capacity, there's the instructional programming capacity that we have that can easily be misunderstood, but the programming decisions we make are try to be made upon the needs of students and the placement of programs to give accessibility so we don't have students traveling across the district to get to a class that is self-contained, um, whatever that classification may be, to make sure that students with special needs have the opportunity to be in that same location as well. I don't know if that was 
everything you were looking for, Ms. Hutchison, um, but if there's something Mr. Richardson manages a lot of reports that has that information, Dr. Harris, of course, with his playing administration, they may have another lens to add to that. So let me pause to either of them to see if they'd like to add anything. I'll just simply say I think that the response that you provided is very sufficient and it gives a clear delineation between core and program capacity. And obviously in the educational arena, we're driven by program capacity more so than we are core capacity. So I yield to the response that you've already provided. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Ms. Gardner. I think, I think we just wanted more clar clarification because just because we've been around a while back when we were talking, uh, my children went to Chapin Elementary back when we were trying to pass the a bond referendum one of those years and one of the negative sticking points was that that building Chapin Elementary had been built for 1100 students that was its capacity that's what we were told and I'll I'm here to tell you my son third grade third grade in a portable so so was two other grade levels in portables with more than 20 kids and there were only 900 students in that in that building so the point that I think that we're trying to ask or I understand it as is that um, what does that number 750 re represent? Is it a core capacity? Is it a program capacity? What are we building to so that when we talk about this in the future, wh what is, um, because if it is just like built for 750, we all know that in five years, it's only gonna hold 500 kids if it's built with the same parameters. But if you're telling us that now we're using different words and different parameters for capacity, then that, it would make us feel better, or make me feel better, to know that the school is going to house 750 at a current program capacity. Because my own experience at Chapin Elementary and Lake Murray, I went, my children went there too, and third grade, you know, parent night, I had to stand in the hallway because the arena wasn't big enough for all the families. And so that's my concern. And, sure. and so I think that's what we're trying to say, is if it's built to 750 in 10 years, are we gonna say, well, that number meant something else. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our question. We just want clarification. I, I can suggest one tool, which um, <clears throat> only speaks to a part of this, and I think your answer, Dr. Melton, was good at clarifying what happens in real life versus the way we design it. And so the assumptions that we make in designing it are on the program spreadsheet that is with the district. And it has a column in it that says number of students. Mm -hmm. You, you can total them all up, and when you get to the end, you'll see 750. So you can see the assumptions made for each space. Not all spaces have a number associated with it, but for the ones that do, you can see what the assumptions are for teachers and students in the classroom and how it, it's very, it's, it's more simple, relatively more simple in an elementary school than it is the upper grades, where there are a lot more variables. But, you know, that, that is certainly available. We can provide additional uh, copies of it. Everybody on the programming committee uh, worked that spreadsheet a good bit. So that could be made available. So, Mr. Gann, if I may sorry. add, sorry. I, I respect the questions. I wasn't here then. So hearing this kind of things gives us historical context to make sure as we message, Ms. Goggins and Dr. Harrison, the executive staff know we keep talking about how we message this to make sure many voices send one message. So this helps us. One thing I'd like to add to make sure that the board is aware of, and of course the community as well, this board has been committed since my arrival in 2007 and well before I've arrived in 2007 as a principal in this district of protecting class size. Dr. Jakes and her teams, they use that when they're going out to recruit teachers that our board monitors how many students we have assigned in our classes because we know there are some neighbors who have up to 30 depending on any class. We're fortunate, our board makes sure that we've been on top of that. So when thinking about numbers, if we think about, let's say 100 students and divide it by four, then you're of course going to have 25 kids. And if class size permits that, you got four classes. But if our class size would be lower than that, then you're gonna need five classes. So class size is an integral part of this success if we're going to maintain the class size that this board has been committed to that has quite frankly led to our retention rate to be so successful. So that may help us with our messaging to the community, the numbers to make sure as we explain this, that based on our class size board policy, 
here's what we're looking at, and that's how we've tried to use this for this design to be in compliance with board policy, to be in compliance with the programming needs. Mr. Giuliano has been involved with working with Dr. Slatton of what special services might be warranted based on our students that we can predict now that are in preschool, that are going to go into elementary schools to offer them assurance that they too will have programming at this school. So there's lots of different moving pieces that can help us make sure that we manage this message to be um, one of assurance rather than confusion. Mr. Loveless. Mr. Quackenbush, is the structure of the building masonry load-bearing or is it structural steel? It appears that it's the majority of it will be load-bearing masonry. We'll, we will have some structural steel if you think about some of the spaces with a lot of glass. Uh, the the, the load-bearing CMU will be augmented with some structural steel. We did do some analysis or Mr. Hughes did some analysis to look at completely flipping the structural system to being 100% structural steel the numbers didn't pan out for us to go in that direction. In other words, it was more expensive to do that. Okay. Um, and you may not be able to answer this question, but I want to make, I want to get it certain in my mind, the construction manager at risk, and Mr. Hughes, you might want to answer this, but um, did, did this board buy your services to guarantee us a, a, that, that, that the uh, project would be bought in, brought into a budget what 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 risk did we did we purchase from you, and what risk do you assume? Yes, sir. So the way the process works is um, instead of just a rip and read at the end of the day, design, bid, build, where you don't know where your budget is until it's too late. We come on board, and before pen hits the paper, and we estimate every day of design to make sure that the design stays within the budget that the owner sets, and um, so that's that's what we're doing. So and we, the, the project is still competitively bid. So we bid every division, minimum three or four prices in every division. So the project is still competitively bid at the end of the day, but we're just testing systems and budget along the way. Okay, so if we reach the 50% stage and we're over the budget, what happens then? Then we tweak the design. Then we go back and redesign, and do we come back all the way that's, to that's this the point whole, to the 15%? That's level? the whole reason for the process is we, we maintain the design within the budget along the way. Okay. All right. So if, if I, I did some work uh, on my own and I looked at cost approaches and I, I did three cost approaches from nationally recognized sources and I came up with a median cost of elementary schools at $186.35 a square foot from those sources. Those okay. sources are not Those sources South were Carolina. the school planning and management, the North Carolina planning, uh, NC PDI, and the RS means guy. Okay, I averaged those together, all those, and I came up with an average mean median cost of construction of about $186. We signed a contract with you guys for $228. Okay, so, so that's 22.5% more, okay? 22.66% 22 more that your contract is versus the median. So what I'm getting at is that we purchased from you the surface to bring that in, and we gave uh, somewhere near 45 to $50 a square foot in addition to the median to do that. And what I'm asking you is when you bring that back in here, we don't want to see, well, I don't want to see construction costs greater than, than, than the $24 million that we, that we were told that we were getting. And, and that is certainly the goal, and I respectfully, um, I respect the numbers you have, and I'll be happy to present other numbers to the board for the past 30 schools built in the state of South Carolina. Mr. Really? Chairman, may I raise a point of order, please? The pricing is not a part of this schematic presentation, and we're no longer, this discussion is not germane to the motion no, it is. before the board. Uh, excuse me. I've raised a point of order for the chair. You're correct. Mr. Mr. Lovis, I think he is correct. We're not talking about the pricing piece of it, but um, the schematic part of that, I don't think we've gotten that far into it. <clears throat> I have a question, Mr. Cates. Mr. Cates. <clears throat> I do see that there are, we will have the opportunity to discuss pricing. Correct. Um, on the time schedule yeah, that, that's up there now. And I, I see that there are two uh, dates where we will have the opportunity to thoroughly discuss 
pricing, and, and I, I assume that those are the times we'll arrive at the uh, guaranteed maximum price. How, why are there two, and what are the differences in those two occasions? Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, so a schematic design estimate has to make lots of assumptions just because of where we are in the process. There's less drawn, there's less figured out, less decisions have been made because at the schematic design level, of, as you've seen, we kind of have the big picture, but there's still lots of details that follow. When you get to the end of design development, we do another pricing exercise. There's a lot more information that has been vetted. You know, as an example, we're uh, trying to set up a series of user meetings over the next three to four weeks where we'll be getting a deeper dive into other issues where we'll be approaching the district about preferences for this or that. Those decisions will inform the content of the design development package, which is another pause in the process where Greg Hughes and his team will do pricing. Then we get to the construction documents. Ver and, and again, that's it's like 15%, then another 20%, then another 40%. So in terms of the amount of time and fee that we're expending, we get more and more and more detailed. Therefore, there's more and more that you can price. It can't really go out to market as a bid until you get closer to the end of that construction documents phase. And that's when you can have confidence and be able to establish a final GMP or guaranteed maximum price. Before that time, we're making assumptions as we put pricing together. The art to this is to be forecasting many of those decisions so that we don't end up making a false assumption that costs a difference in expectation. So if we use your this timeline as it's presented and we use a lot of acronyms and I mean we don't we don't have the GMP uh, I'm scanning it. Well, I see final GMP. Final GMP. But yep. that's basically at the end of 2019. Correct. But we'll have at least at least two other pricing discussions prior that is correct. to that. So that we will have um, um, plenty of, of time to do the thorough discussion of, of pricing of the project. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Hutchison. Well, this was my follow-up question to what I was asking earlier, so I hate to go back to core capacity, but just one last thing is, since there is confusion about core capacity and what I might be calling student capacity, um, I'm wondering if, um, and we don't have to give an answer now, but wonder if there's a way in the school district if we can start, um, if we need to put two columns, an explanation, but I do think you're right that the messaging is, is, is wrong um, and it's easy to understand why people misunderstand um, that. So I would like for us to do a, um, to look at ways that we can make it more clear for people and so that um, they understand we're trying to follow our policy with regard to class size and um, and also looking at our optimal school size for, for all levels. Um, and, and I just, on top of that, you mentioned the programming. I remember when you were um, the chief instructional officer, uh, you did something which was, I, I thought, really great for the special needs children in the Chapin area. Um, I don't know spe all the specifics, but I think that many of the special needs children um, had to travel to the Dutch Fork or the Irmo area. And in order for those children not to stay on the bus or um, for so long, you moved those classes up to the Chapin schools. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Obviously with transportation and collaboration, many people, but that was the vision was to get students back in their neighborhoods, back in their communities, instead of traveling to places where there were programs located to keep the staff together, we relocated to make sure students were in the communities of which they reside. And so then what that did was, as you mentioned, then a classroom that might have been for um, 20 students, then at 2025, then that classroom was then serving the needs of your special needs students, because six to 10 or whatever it was. So, you know, that was really a, a an excellent um, change and decision for the um, families of special needs students and all the special needs students in the Chapin area. Although, you know, it, it did 
decrease the student capacity um, because of taking up the space. But it, I think that was the smartest and, and um, most uh, sensible thing to do. So thank you for, in hindsight, for that. Ms. Hammond. Uh, Mr. Quackenbush, you know all my questions are going to be on safety. Yes, ma'am. Um, and a lot of them you did answer for me, but I'd like them answered for the public. Sure. Um, but before we leave the core capacity, I, I would like to ask you if I'm correct about this. Whether, how, and I agree, it is a lot of communication that's, and, and when we're spending taxpayers' dollars, they need to understand. Because a lot of people thought for years, at least Lake Murray had certain core capacity and we could have added on instead of portables, but we never did. And the point is, if we get it straight, I think your point is well taken that we communicate that. But I, I did want to ask this before I go to my safety. Am I right about this, Mr. Quackenbush? Once core capacity is established and a school is built, you really can't, you, add, you can't add on if you decided to add on years later. Does it have to, you, you can it change from the core you, capacity? You, you can add on, but it's painful. Pain, yeah, I'm so it mean, means tend, it, tend it, it to never do it. That's how you do lunch is different, as okay. an example. I got you. That, that, um, was, that was what I was. Yeah. Now, so, I'm, I'm to my questions. Um, they're all to do with safety, Mr. Gant. Uh, number one, of course, that um, how you had to think long and hard about the location and, you know, you have lots of areas for the traffic to come off the road because that's such a dangerous road. Um, I worry a little bit, and I want you to explain it to the public. It's not a very deep lot, it, but it's a long lot. So you feel very confident that the way we've got it, we'll get traffic off of there. Very, with very ease. confident. I feel like we've been very, very conservative. And I know that's all the thing. Um, also, I asked you about a traffic light. That, and I think you're explaining it, something, I learned something that night. You can't, we can't ask for that now. They have to wait and do a traffic study before there will be a traffic light there. It's a, it's a South Carolina DOT that's, decision. Right. Uh, so, we will certainly design that. It, it is going to be configured so that our main car loop is right across from uh, Lake Tide, Lake, I always screw that street Tide. up, the cross street. <laughs> Um, so it aligns with that, so that that would be a natural place to signalize if DOT permitted it. But they they feel like our traffic design does not require a traffic light. There oh, will wow. have to be something well, that um, encourages them to do a study, and the study will have to prove that it is needed before they will install it. And the cost of the traffic light will be the districts. Uh, no, that'll that'll be DOT. They all have to pay for it. Yeah, but Good. we are putting in infrastructure so that that can be handled easily. So the infrastructure conduit. that has to get there first is our cost. We will put conduits. We discussed putting conduits in the ground so that wiring and other things are easy to accommodate. And it's not so much about the cost; it's about not tearing something up to put it in right. later. And then, as beautiful as it is, um, with you know all the things that are terrible that can happen at a school. I was very concerned about a lot of the glass right? and whether it was, you know, and I know you told me bulletproof glass is very expensive, yeah, it's um, not, but will it's, you tell um, the what, public what about we, our... I'm sorry, Jan. Uh, no, just about the glass. And I'll um, show so we brought in a security expert. Uh, Mr. Quackenbush, do you yes. mind pulling this um, microphone a little, up a little, little bit, bit closer? closer to you, okay. please? Your yeah, it's, uh, maybe it it move it up. How's that? Better? Okay. Is that, is that um, work? So we, we brought in a security consultant, someone that was highly credentialed to, to work with our programming committee to work through the concepts of security in schools and to guide us on where the best bang for the buck is. Uh, and he introduced us, the design team, um, um, uh, um, introduced a new product to us. It's a school safety glass. That is, we've got a brand name, but that's exactly what it was designed for. The big driver in the design of that glass was not so much bullets, it is impact resistance. Because the biggest problem with glass is that it allows entry into your secured perimeter. And so it is our goal to have all of the first floor glass to be this special school safety glass that would restrict someone from being able to get in. They showed us a video of sledgehammers trying to get through this glass. And Could a bullet go through it? A bullet would... Uh, uh, a high-powered rifle bullet could probably go through it, but that is not the biggest concern. The biggest concern is getting in the school. And then this is 
not as important as safety, but money. Uh, heating and air with that much glass, oh, is yeah, that yeah. a greater um, expense? No, we, we have glass where it's going to be impactful, mm -hmm. and it will be high performance, energy high performance, low E glazing. So um, we will be covered in terms of HVAC. We've already got preliminary sizes on the HVAC units, and they're well within the norms. And then when we and see... And it will also be shaded glass. This is a conversation uh, that uh, Mr. Loveless and I had. We'll have passive shading devices in all the southern glass and the east and west glass to, again, reduce any kind of solar gain from the glass. Another question I got that day when, you know, you invited the public there. Uh, all the nice, pretty furniture in there, that, that's not our furniture that that I mean we that we get that later right that we're just no, suggesting I a know, few things. I, it's really pretty it really is uh, last thing about and this isn't a safety thing but just I know it was very important to you for it to fit in with the um, landscape um, some of the trees were natural there in this in this picture right but we do I think you did explain to me we've got to plant a lot of trees we do yeah, there, there are ordinances and regulations that we have to follow uh, in terms of the buffer yards, and that has already been designed at a schematic design level and is being priced. Thank you. Mr. Lovers, who was first? I don't know. Were you first? You, you, go ahead. Okay. I was, you mentioned uh, the solar heat gain, okay, and you've designed uh, our middle school. Mm -hmm. And also, I know another one that I looked at, went and looked at, was Muller Road. Mm -hmm. And that has a, I mean, the, both of those have a, a lot of glass, mm -hmm. okay? And both of those have clear stories and mm -hmm. fenestration <laughs> from the roof, okay? So, you chuckle, sir. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you, can, you can tell us that the life cycle costing for utilities and maintenance on those two buildings how, how do they stack up versus, say, one of our other existing lately built schools like Oak Point Elementary or? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of variables there, Ken, yeah. as you know. Um, yeah. Without seeing any data, I wouldn't know. But we do have on our team a mechanical engineer, Bill Livingston, who yeah. has done a lot of the work in the district, including some of the retrofit work that's coming up. Um, we can ask him for some comparative analysis uh, and, and hopefully he will do that for us just so we have a little bit of a better understanding. Again, we have been designing to standards with other school districts where they have an expectation about the utility bill. We're finding that the biggest driver in running those bills up is not the amount of glass, it's the amount of air circulation. Right. That's the big driver and that's because the code is changing to make fresh air uh, more abundant and that means a lot of heat um, air exchanges, that's really driving up HVAC costs. So if you look at something that's 10 years old, you may say, well, that has less glass and its energy bill is a lot less than Chapin Middle School. In reality, it was to a different ASHRAE 90.1 code on air circulation. Right, I mean, I, I, I so, realize that. I mean, yeah. I realize the codes have changed and, and then another is lighting, you got LED lighting and things like that to take the heat, heat load from the lights out Absolutely. and all. But, you know, can we, and this, this is just, uh, you know, totally innocent. I'm asking, can, can we expect that, that, um, that this, this school would probably be comparable to our middle school? In, in yeah, that I, th regard? I think so. And again, I'm not the expert, but we have one on the team. We can get clarification on that. I think we would have heard by now if there was any concern about that. We're using good uh, uh, passive solar technique to make right, sure that right. we're not putting a lot of exposure on the really compromising facades, which is east and west, particularly right. west. And we talked about that. And we I, did. And, and yeah. I wanted to make sure that, I mean, this, this is more for the people that are not in the industry to understand that, that the, the life cycle costing of it is all kinds of people talking about things. I just want to reassure that, that, yes. that we could probably look at that. And Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Mr. Gates. <clears throat> Mr. Quackenbush, can you just uh, talk a little more on the safety uh, aspect, uh, Mr. Phil Santori and his involvement, and just uh, if you're able off the top of your head, and that's dangerous, I got in trouble doing that tonight once, so, um, but I'll, yeah, I'll right. ask you just, I, I know his, his uh, renown in the industry, and can you talk about some of his key projects and how he was engaged at, 
at this project with the meetings that were held and that kind of thing? Uh, so Phil is with uh, DVS uh, Security. Uh, he is the security consultant for the replacement Sandy Hook Elementary School, uh, which is obviously a very powerful case study. Uh, and they were very, very cutting edge in the work that they did and introduced at that school. He was also the security consultant for Ground Zero. So uh, very, very, Ground Zero. Ground Zero. Yeah. Um, so uh, we had Phil come in for a two-day workshop. Uh, he spent most of the first day talking about concepts, most of the second day drilling into case studies. We had Phil, um, I, I mentioned the school safety glass. I think that was a, a very significant um, uh, epiphany in the process. Uh, and again, we're looking to incorporate that into this school. Um, but we also went through the plans with Phil and he would say, I'm not comfortable with that nook, I'm not comfortable with that cranny. Yes, you can do glass here. You may wanna reverse the door swing here. The, an, an example you may recall is he said typically you have the latching side of a door next to a window, a side light. He recommends reversing that because you can bust out the glass of the side light and reach around and unlock the door. So by simply reversing the door, you avoid that problem. And he, so he looked at the plan as it was being developed and has made recommendations uh, that you've incorporated in that yes, plan. Sir. Yes, sir. And because I was fortunate to attend two of those meetings as part of the programming, uh, process. He also had a conversation with Lexington County uh, who who provided their officers to be a part of that two-day meeting and also were able to give input on the safety and security. That is correct. Site. He he counseled them. They participated in the conversation. I think we had EMS there for a short time as well. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Ms. Hammond? He made me think of something. I was under the impression EMS, and if you just said you talked with them, EMS did not have services out there at this point, an ambulance on Amos Ferry Road. I hope I was wrong about hearing that, but you did First talk I heard to them. You just, I thought you I said. I believe that we had representatives there. They were invited, and I it believe It may have been um, from count, the, the county council, you know, the infrastructure out there, and they're working on that. I know Erin, I think, came and spoke to the board. Um, I think of her last name, but she's on the the Lexington County Council and from Chase. Um, and I know they're working real hard and want us to work with them right. in planning and, you know, being sure infrastructure, because that's so important that a school has access to EMS. And, and that's the spirit service. in which we, we approach them. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Quackenbush, I had a, just a follow up to Mr. Lovelace's question. And I know we've had this discussion before when uh, Chapin Middle was built. And there's an interest in, I know you talked about passive solar and, and angling of building and so forth, but one of the things that we talked to you about with Chapin Middle, and I would love for you to consider at, as you move forward on this with your consultant on, on the heat and air, but we at the Center for Advanced Technical Studies, we have students collecting solar energy, and they're using it for certain parts of the school, and, they're, and, there's, and, it, and we're talking about one or two panels so we know it's real, we know it's not the end all be all. But I'd love, since we invest in students' education to say this is a reality for the future, mm -hmm. that, that we have some consideration of that. If, if it doesn't, if we won't work there, that's fine. If it will work there in some capacity, some of those same students may end up at the center someday collecting uh, energy that may go back to that school or another school. So I just ask you to keep that in mind as we move forward with the design it's, it's, a, it's a great reminder um, because I believe, in fact, I believe we had this conversation with uh, Chris uh, Patrick about how we need to set up the infrastructure up front on the electrical side to even accommodate that in a practical way later on. So there's a way, we will, we will look for a way uh, <clears throat> using his expertise to set up the infrastructure so that could be an added on feature even if we can't have it day one. Um, so I think that's the, that's the kind of the deal breaker. You have a window for that maybe to take place. Now, and again, I don't understand fully what the cost of that infrastructure would be. That might be one of those things we bring back to you and say, right. well, it may cost this and is right. worth it, but, but certainly it can be explored. And you know, that's part of a learning curve too. If, if we, and I think the gentleman at the center that heads it up is Patrick Smallwood. And uh, if we could, 
if we could make that part of the discussion to at least look at it, and then maybe the, the students could be a part of that to learn that it doesn't work in every situation. Mm -hmm. Just because it's solar and you can put panels up, that may not be the, the, the result you're looking for. But I would love for that to be part of the consideration. And personally, I think the board, too, we're investing a lot with our students to explore those options. Right. And then, and uh, Ms. Gardner, I wanted to, you and I had a little bit of this discussion before, but I, I do remember this whole thing, and I hate to go back to core capacity, program capacity. The, uh, I've seen the program, I think you have too, for Chapin Elementary School. I can't remember what year it was built, but in the 80s, I think. And the program touts that it is built for 1,100 and some students. It's printed, it's in ink on a piece of paper, and that is gospel That's right. to this day for some folks. But you're living proof that it's not working well. Yeah. Yeah. And there are plenty of portables that Chapin Elementary, and Ms. Hammond, I don't believe you said this, but I thought I heard this. Did you say there were not portables at? No, I said there were. Lake there Murray? Were. I said there were. There were. There so we know there's lots of portables there now. So um, anyway, I've seen that same brochure, and it just, things change. I think, Mr. Quackbush, you've seen this in your industry. What used to be the standard 20 years ago, before we had certain programs, that standard in our state or nationwide wouldn't, wouldn't fly today. You, and Chapin Elementary is probably a great example of that. Here we are 20 some years removed mm -hmm. and it's not built and set up for 1,100 students in the current programs that are there. It, so, it, does, it doesn't really make sense to me even if I look at it with the lens of 10 years ago. I mean, I, all I can imagine is that someone suggested a core capacity, which is again influenced by <clears throat> how many hours of the day you might serve a meal and said that it could do this, but I doubt you have the classrooms that would support 900 kids there, or you wouldn't have the portables. So it doesn't really add up to me, but that's not Thank me. You. Any other questions? Mr. Cates. I just want to, not a question, but I would like to get some clarification. Dr. Melton, you may uh, have to help with this because I don't want to leave anything, um, any, any misstatements. I believe EMS was invited but I don't remember them participating. So I don't want to give the impression that they were in the meeting with Mr. Santori. They were invited. Uh, Lexington County sent several uh, folks from the Sheriff's Department uh, who participated uh, in that discussion. So I just didn't want. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't want to Thank you. have a misstatement. Uh, yeah. I'm remembering it's, the invite. Yeah. If I may add, Dr. Harris took the lead on making sure we invited as many as we could from Lexington County. So we had a list of a variety of agencies and we did extend the invitation. Of course, we couldn't require everyone to be in attendance, but there was a strong representation from law enforcement that had interest and engagement and were there for the duration of the time together. So thank you for that clarification, Mr. Cates. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hammond. This is just an observation, but, I, but I'd like to say it, say it, especially since we're in the Irmo cluster area tonight. I think one thing is we build new schools that that this board and any board you've got to look though we have areas that are growing and we have areas that we have lost enrollment in some of our schools in certain clusters in certain areas and I think as we build a new school you know you can understand people coming with questions about have we ever looked at rezoning or trying to fill up a school that's losing or looking at the whole big picture not just chafing where it's growing because you want equity in these schools. And, and I know this whole board wants that, in fairness to all our children. And so as you build a new beautiful school, you also have to keep in mind justification for schools that don't have that many kids in them anymore. And so I just say that as we're talking about capacity, because people do look at what you said nine years ago or 10 years ago, and they hold this leadership and this board accountable for what, what, how we're spending the tax dollars. And we just need to sh be sure every student is in a good school with, you know, it can, they can't all be new, but we can keep older schools up to par so that all of our children are in an environment that's fair and equitable. Mm -hmm. Just an observation, <clears throat> Mr. Gant. That was an observation. Mr. Quackenbush, you don't have to answer that. Because there was no, no question in there. I would agree so. with didn't have a lot to do with this, but it did have to do with our whole district. So, is there anything related to the schematic point in time we're in now for Mr. Quackenbush? Mr. Quackenbush, thank you for being thank here you. tonight. We look.
forward to further visits. We see them coming up. Yes, sir. And, Thank uh, you very we much. We appreciate you all being here. You Thank bet. you. Thank you. That brings us to our adjourning that's coming up. And then I would like to remind the um, board that the next regular scheduled meeting will be at Chapin Middle School on March the 18th. And with that, I'd like to. Um, can't we have a special call meeting yes Ms. Hutchins just remind me of that but our next uh, meeting will actually be the 25th of this month and it will be at nursery road elementary school and with, for the sole purpose of looking at the facility study it's being done by mb con so we're hoping that that is finalized soon i know you're working hard with them to get that done and and for the board members our plan is to get copies to you as soon as it's published and finalized, and that has not happened yet. So that's uh, two weeks from tonight. So any other items? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Ms. Hutchison. I move that we adjourn. I have a second. Ms. Hammond seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, thank you all for being here. Everybody raise your hand, and <laughs> we can all go home. Thank you. <laughs>